And ultimately, a man must be judged not on the basis of the color of his skin, but the content of his character. It takes the willingness to stand by and do what has to be done when it has to be done. We must not forget that our sisters and brothers are waiting for a bright, peaceful future. God so loved the world, the black world, the white world, the yellow world. And he loves us all the same. Man, there's some cool things going on in this church. Uh, uh, Summer and I know Andrew and uh, Kendra really well, and so we are pumped. We are pumped about what's happening here. Uh, but it, hey, if you are new to Victory, you are kind of getting baptized by fire right now, right? The series that we are in, uh, this is not uh, the type of series you would normally hear. We're going to say provocative words. We're going to say words like black and white, <laughs> and Republican, and Democrat. We're not going to fight about it, okay? That's the beautiful thing about this. You're kind of hearing maybe some things that you wouldn't normally hear. You're going to kind of hear what Victory talks about, how we talk about it. Uh, we believe that if you don't talk about real things, you get fake people. And so we're kind of tackling what I would say is one of the, if not the top thing staring in the face uh, of this generation, the need of this generation, which is unity. Uh, and the flip side of that, division. You know, how, how do we tackle this? How do we talk about this? What does God have to say about this? Uh, how important this is? And specifically, unity along skin color lines. And I know this is such like a touchy sort of a thing. So give me grace, because uh, everybody's about to get offended. It's about to happen, all right? Um, really, here's kind of the idea that we're embracing, is that uh, we are not multiple competing races. We are not like the black race and the white race and the Latino race and the Asian race. We are one race of people. We are the human race. We are one people. We may look a little different. We may talk a little different. We may have some different cultures, but we are much more alike than we are different. And we're refusing to allow our differences to drive us apart because we are better together than we are separate. Come on. And I believe, you wouldn't be here if you didn't believe that. And if you don't believe that, I hope that God would change you over the next few minutes. If not, there are plenty of other churches around here that you could just go and be with everybody else who looks just like you. But we believe that we are better together than we are separate. And here's what Jesus has to say about this thing called unity. John 17, verse 20. He says this, he's praying for us. He's pr he says, I pray that they will all be one. Everybody say one. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. That last line there is so incredibly important. Lots of times we just breeze right past that. What he's saying is when we're one together and when we're Christians, when we're one in, in Christ, he said that's when the world's finally going to believe that Jesus came from the Father. What he's saying, though, is this. The counter to that is when we're divided, when we just divide along our lines and we argue and we bitter, we lose our witness. And I believe, I believe this, is that the world is tired of seeing a multicultural world and a single culture church, right? I believe it is a terrible thing when we drop our kids off at the mall or whatever, and they're hanging out with all the world at the mall on Saturday night, and then Sunday morning they go to a white church or a black church or a Latino church, Asian church. And, and I believe that God is calling us to be one because when we're one, that's when the world's finally gonna believe that Jesus was sent from the Father. Um, in 1960, what is that, 58 years ago, Martin Luther King Jr. uttered those famous words that the church hours in America are the most segregated hours in America. And I can vouch for this. I'm around pastors a lot. And one of the most difficult things is to get pastors of any color and any culture out of their four walls and actually embracing reconciliation, but especially white pastors and Asian pastors. But I'm telling you this today, guys, it's changing. I'm in the meetings. It's changing. Here's what I'm telling you. I'm starting to see white pastors get woke. Come on. It is happening. I'm in these meetings and I'm seeing that because I've been immersed in this for so long. I'm starting to see white pastors be like, wait, wait, you mean because I, what? Whoa. Like, I've never seen these things before. And I'm starting to see this thing turn because 
God's plan and God's will for us is to be one people. And what we're doing is one race. In less than two weeks, we're heading to Stone Mountain. Come on, Jesus. August 25th, heading to Stone Mountain. Uh, with hundreds of pastors, hundreds of churches, tens of thousands of Christians in the city, including you. You need to be there August 25th. It's a big day, 10 to 6. It is a big day. It is, we believe that what God is doing here, it is a movement. It's not just a moment, but it is having moments. And we believe that this is going to be the biggest moment of where God is, uh, is taking us. Because what we believe is that racism isn't a wrestle against flesh and blood. This is a spiritual battle. And the language that God is giving us is that at Stone Mountain, when we pray, we believe that the back of racism is gonna be broken off of Atlanta. That's what we're saying. And we believe that the ripple effects, here's what we believe, that God is sparking a spiritual movement in Atlanta that's gonna have societal uh, repercussions. The ripple effects are gonna ring out across Atlanta and then the whole Southeast. And we believe ultimately the entire country. This is how big our faith is for this because we got to own this. Every area has their own thing. The South has re racism and religion. That's our two things. We got to own it and we got to war against it. And God is assembling an army right now to do that so that we could be one people. I don't know if you're along for the ride, but I'm along for the ride. I believe God is building a team here that's along for that ride for us to be one people. And this is important. We have to do this because um, we live in the same world, right? Like there is so much racial tension right now that it's ridiculous. Like I've, listen, it's not like I've been alive forever, but this is the most I've ever seen in my lifetime. The, the, it's, it's everywhere, it's pervasive, it's scary, it's in your face, you turn left and right. I mean, there's just, ah, everybody's angry, everybody's offended. Even right now, like literally right now, there's a white supremacist rally going on in Washington, D.C. on the anniversary of Charlottesville called Unite the Right Two. It was the most original name they could come up with. They were like, the first one was the first one, this will be two. Right, And there, there are 950 um, uh, hate groups in America. 70% are white supremacist groups. Uh, and in response to that, there are all these like counter hate groups that are rising up. And the boiling point is right there, is right there. But here's what we know. We know that the government is not the answer. Come on, Jesus. Violence is not the answer. Politicians are not the answer. Jesus is the answer. That's what we know. And that's what we're sharing. Like, Jesus is the only one who can move us from toleration to reconciliation. Jesus is the only one who can move us from goodwill to oneness and love. Like, like Jesus is the only one. G the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only answer strong enough to actually address all the, all the things that we don't have answers for. Like, how do you fix America? The only answer that's strong enough is the good news of Jesus. We believe that there is a vertical answer to the issues we see in the world. There's a vertical answer, the gospel of Jesus, which then has a horizontal action that we take place. The answer is found in Christ, but then we internalize it and we take it out into the world. Because we believe this. We believe that the government can change the laws, but it's Jesus that changes the hearts. And that's what God has put inside us. So what we have to do, here's kind of the whole mission. What we have to do is that we kind of got to get our stuff in order, right? Is the church. Like the church has got some issues. Like we got to get our stuff in order. We got to become one and then use our voice in the midst of this conversation. Because if, if we, the people of God, don't use our voice in the midst of the racial tension, then somebody else is going to use their voice. And I promise you, it will not lead people to life and love and peace. It will lead to destruction and hate and death. And so we have to use our voice. But here's, here's what it's going to take, okay? And this is kind of one of the things I've discovered over the last year or so. We have to care about this when nobody else cares about it. Here's what I mean. We have to care about unity even when CNN isn't talking about it. Because we allow the news cycle to drive way too much of what we care about. Instead of understanding, man, no, I belong to a different kingdom. Like, I need to care about it because God cares about it. And I've seen this firsthand because, listen, I, I've gone to all these one-race prayer events, and that's, that's, that's kind of like the, the regional gatherings of multiple churches coming together. And here's how I know, listen, here's how I know whether or not the, the church will be packed with people praying for unity. Did somebody get shot this week? If nobody got shot, it'll be about 25% of what it could be. But man, if something happened, oh, we got to fix it. We got to change it. And I believe that what God is saying is, listen, we got to care about things before Charlottesville happens. 
we got to care about unity before somebody gets shot. Like, we, we got to care about this because God cares about this, because this is a kingdom agenda. we got to care about this because this is actually important to the heart of God. Oneness, unity, reconciliation is important. This is part of the kingdom. And, and Scripture is really clear on this in the New Testament. It says that Jesus is, is like the groom and the church is the bride. You know what I'm talking about? Don't worry, men, you don't have to wear a dress. Um, it's talking about, like, corporately we're the bride. Like, man, you're not like the bride of Christ. We are the bride. Okay, so I know sometimes that messes with guys. You're like, oh, I'm not sure about that. I'm saying, like, the church is. And, and here's the idea. Jesus is the groom. The church is the bride. And, and here's what I believe is important for us to know is that Jesus isn't into polygamy. In other words, Jesus isn't coming back for a Latino bride and a white bride and a black bride and an Asian bride and a Republican bride and a Democrat bride, right? And a Baptist bride and a Catholic bride. No, Jesus is coming back for one bride. Jesus is coming back for one united, holy, pure, Christ-loving people. And so we have to be one. All right, John sees this. He gets a glimpse of heaven, Revelation 7, 9. He sees this. This is a prophetically of the very end. He says, after this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and every tribe and every people and every language. They were standing in front of the throne together before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And this is the idea. We will be one in heaven. There's not a black section and a white section in heaven. Right? I love thinking about that. That's just not going to happen. It's so stupid to even think about that. Like, we're going to be one in heaven. And Jesus' prayer is that here would look like there. And when we do that, if we can get there, guys, I feel like we're so close here at Victory. But if we can finally do this, when we become one, that's when the world's going to know that Jesus was sent from the Father. All right, But when we're divided, what we're really telling the world is, is that the blood of Jesus is enough to forgive us, but it's not enough to unite us. And that's not okay. That's not okay. We got to be one. So how do we do it? How do we do it? Let's drill down on that for today. How do we actually become one? Here's our scripture, Colossians 3, 12. Here's what it says. Internalize this for ourselves, for each one of us. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, and with patience. Make allowance for each other's faults. Man, that's good, isn't it? Don't you wish somebody would do that for you? Make allowance when other people mess up. And forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And above all, clothe yourselves with love. Let's repeat that together. Clothe yourselves with love. Do you just get that, that imagery? Clothe yourself with love, with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And what Jesus' message to us today is this, is that if we're ever going to have unity, first we have to have love. The, the way that we're ever going to have unity is to have love. And if we're ever actually going to experience oneness, we have to learn how to walk in this higher way called love. Um, just, just recently, I, I watched a little bit of this HBO special called King in the Wilderness. Anybody seen that? King in the Wilderness? Okay, wow. Nobody has HBO. That's probably a good thing. Um, <laughs> um, so King in the Wilderness, and really what it is, it's, it's, it's this documentary full of clips that I don't think anybody had really seen before of Dr. King, and seeing like some of his life that like makes him human. You know, see, I, I was watching one of the interviews, and he's like, he's not this clean, polished and everything. He's like talking, well, I don't, uh, uh, and I'm like, whoa, you're, you're a human. <laughs> you're a human, too. And, and there's one of these scenes where Dr. King is walking. This is, this is amazing. I mean, it just blows your mind. He's, he's walking down um, just a southern dirt road at the front of a march of hundreds of people. And he's, Dr. King is standing here, and Dr. Stokely Carmichael is standing here. Dr. Carmichael is the one uh, who actually coined the, the term black power. He was a leader in the Black Panther, Panthers and the, uh, the student movement for them. And what you have is a white reporter standing in the middle of Dr. King and Dr. Carmichael and holding the mic back and forth, and they're basically politely debating the validity of violence or nonviolence. 
And, and you know, he holds the microphone over to Dr. Carmichael and says, hey, listen, I grew up in New York and I found out early on if you want something, you have to take it with your fists. And he holds the microphone over to Dr. Dr. King. He said, what would you say about that? And he says, well, I, I would understand how my friend would say that, but uh, I do not believe that that's the right approach to this thing, that we have to rise above, you know, the people who would come against us, but we have to do it differently. And, I mean, they're just going back and forth and back and, back and forth. And, and what's, what, what basically, you, you read between the lines, what they're saying is this, is Dr. Carmichael is saying this, we have to fight for equality. We have to fight for equality. But Dr. King over here is saying this. He's saying, absolutely, I want equality, but my goal is actually something much bigger than equality. It's unity. It's oneness. And here's what Dr. King knew, which I think maybe we could take a little lesson from. He knew that you could not achieve unity through violence. You could achieve equality, but you can't achieve unity through violence. You can only achieve unity through love. That's why Dr. King said this. He said, uh, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And he knew this. He knew that you cannot defeat the devil by becoming the devil. You got to do it different. He said that the, o- the only way that we're going to actually win in this battle against the ones who hate us is we have to morally rise above them. The only way that we're going to win this war that we're in is through love. And, and I believe that what he was doing was he was agreeing with the gospel of Jesus that says, hey, guys, if we're ever going to actually have unity, if we're ever actually going to have love, we're going to actually learn, have to learn how to walk in this higher way of love. And uh, we actually came, I came across this short video clip. It's about two minutes long, um, <clears throat> talking about showing maybe just with skin on the power of what happens when somebody encounters somebody who's walking in love. Uh, let's show this real quick. For Ken Parker, this harmony didn't always exist. This time last year, he was immersed in hate. Ken joined the KKK in 2012. You would actually wear this when you all were burning crosses. Yes, ma'am. But still, he wanted more. Klan wasn't hateful enough for me, so I decided to become a Nazi. Which is why, when hundreds of white nationalists descended on Charlottesville one year ago, Ken was there. All the things you could have picked to say, I want to be a part of this group, and I want this to be a part of my identity. Why whiteness? I had gotten out of the Navy. It was really hard to get a job, and it's really easy to blame it on somebody else. You know, we have people with darker skin in our country, you know, taking my job. But just seven months after that rally, he bumped into a man who made an offer that would change his life. He invited me and my fiance to go to church. And I was like, well, it's worth a shot. That man was a black pastor. When I, say yes. I just asked Ken to share his testimony. I need y'all to hear this. So you've got a 70 person congregation now. They're all black and just three white people, including you. Yes, ma'am. They welcomed him in love. I thought, you know, they would judge me, but no, everybody was like really friendly. When we make it to heaven, Heaven just not going to be one race. What would you say to the people who you may have offended or hurt? I, I want to say I'm sorry. I know I've spread hate and discontent. Probably made little kids uh, scared to sleep in their own beds. Hello, I'm with you always. Now, Ken is still navigating uncharted waters into a wave. Better than I did the last time I had a robe on. <laughs> of love. God bless you. Morgan Radford, NBC News, Jacksonville, Florida. Ken Parker, this harmony. <laughs> Y'all saw that baptism, right? I saw that baptism. <laughs> you will go down. <laughs> I, I think there's a little something in there, don't you? <laughs> like, oh, you think you just go roll up and whoosh. Um, we need more stories like that, don't we? Come on, we need more stories like that. Uh, that's the power of walking in love, <clears throat> doing it different. Um, I, uh, I, I'm just like you. I, I saw that video, and I was like, hey, let's see what people are saying about this. Never read the comments. <clears throat> Never read the comments. Because there are plenty of people who are like, wow, praise God, that's amazing what he can do in somebody's heart. And it took me about 90 seconds to find three comments. Let me, let me, let me put these up here for you. Here's the first one, which is, which is actually by a white woman, which is surprising says, don't trust him as far as I can throw him. (laughs) Believe what you want, but let's see what he does to redeem himself over a couple of years. There's another one. Who a person is never changes. This man has been hating us like the rest of his kind for a long time, and you just don't change that within six months. Here's the third one. 
It's a complete waste of time trying to love anyone who hates you. It's utterly foolish. It's a complete waste of time trying to love anyone who hates you. It's utterly foolish. I am so glad Jesus didn't think like that. Come on. I am so glad Jesus loved us even when we hated him. Even while we were his enemies, he died for us. And he said of the same ones who were literally crucifying him, he says, Father, forgive them. Forgive them, forgive them, forgive them, forgive them. I'm so glad Jesus chose love even in the midst of persecution and hardship and offense. And, and for us to ever get to this place called unity, we're going to have to learn how to walk somehow, somehow in this thing called the higher way of love. Let's give, let me give you a, a, few, a few thoughts on that. Here's the first way uh, of being able to walk in this, this path of life. I have to understand that my love for God is measured by the person I love the least. Whew. Either say amen or ouch. Like, my, my, my thought is the same as your thought. Uh, I remember uh, Pastor Dennis uh, said this, that he heard uh, one of his Bible school teachers say this. And the initial reaction is like, no, please not. <laughs> please say that's not true. Because God, like, no, for real, like, our love for God is measured by the person we love the most, right? No, it's actually the least. Which kind of brings up the question, who do you love the least? I know some people, the person they love the least is their spouse. Maybe right now it's your kids. Maybe they're driving you crazy. Maybe, maybe, maybe um, it's the president. Can we be real? <laughs> like, if you, you put the whole 7 billion people out, who's at the bottom? All right? Maybe it's a people group. Maybe it's, it's, it's black people or white people. Um, Christians, we love picking who we're going to hate. Like the, the, of my generation, we love to hate gay people. Maybe you love the least. Maybe it's gay people. Maybe it's rich people. Maybe it's poor people. It's all their fault, whatever that is. Who do we love the least? And let me tell you, your love for that, that person or that group is actually how much you love God. And I know you, we don't agree. First John 4.20. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Here's our command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Love them even if they hate you. Yes. Love them even if they gossip about you. Yes. Love them even if they stab you in the back and blow you up on Facebook. Yes. Yes. Love them even if they hate you and they've never met you. Yes, yes. And I think what, what Jesus is telling us is we got to do it different. We got to do it different than everybody else. One of my favorite things in the New Testament, what Jesus tells his disciples, he says this phrase. He says, not so with you. I don't know if you remember that. What he's saying is, hey, listen, I ever, this is how the world works. I, I know you know the, how the world works, but not so with you. Jesus is like a really good dad to his disciples. Any, any parents out there, you do this in your house? Like, I don't care if little Billy's jumping off a cliff. You ain't jumping off a cliff. I don't care if he's going to that movie. You ain't going to that movie. You know, like this is what a good parent does. Yeah, I know what everybody else is doing, but that's not what our family's gonna look like. And that's what Jesus says time and time and time again. He says, listen, I don't care how the world's doing it. They're going to divorce each other. They're going to hate each other. They're going to gossip about each other. They're going to be offended at each other. Not so with you. Not you got to do it different because we are in this world, but we are not of this world. We have to do it different than everybody else does it. And, and so the really good question, right? The really good question is this, who do I love the least? Like a really good prayer, like right now in your own heart, would be, God, who do I love the least? Is it a face? Is it a memory? Is it a people group? And then just right behind that prayer saying, God, whew, give me a supernatural love for that person or those people, whatever that is. God, I, I know that my love for you is determined on how much I love even the least of these in my life. God, 
I know that the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive, so let that living love come on the inside of me. I can only love because you love me first. So God, help me to share the love that's, that you've put on the inside of me. I don't have the capacity to love people like that, but God, you do. And so God, give me that love. Help me to love people. Help me to love people who hate me, who abuse me, who use me, who stab me in the back, because I got to do it differently than everybody else. And that's how we're going to start walking in the way of love. Here's the second one, which is really the meat of the whole thing. Walking in the higher way of love. Here's the second thing. I must rise above the offenses in my life. I have to rise above the offenses in my life. Let's just ask the question. Let's just go. We are talking about offenses in, in any sort of relationship, but especially skin color lines, okay? Um, raise your hand if somebody from another culture or skin color has ever offended you. It's about half of us. Right? The other half are liars. <laughs> all right. Now a white guy has offended you, so we're all on the same page. Um, no, no, here's what I think. Um, I, I want to clarify the word offense. I'm going to do that in a second because I think some of us are offended and we don't even think we're offended. And I'll tell you from my own story in just a minute. But here's, here's, here's what offense does. Proverbs 18, 19 says, A brother offended is more unyielding than a strong city, and quarreling is like the bars of a castle. Anybody found this out before? That it's like you, 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 somebody gets offended, and then the bars go up, right? Like prison bars around your heart, prison bars around your mind, prison bars around compassion. If you've ever been offended, or I know we all have, but trying to talk to somebody who's offended, you can't get through, man, you, because there's bars that are up, right? No, no, I'm fine. You didn't do it. No, I'm good, right? Because their bars are right there. You can't reason with somebody who's offended because they're not thinking in truth. They're thinking in emotions, they're not looking through the lens of, of, of love anymore. They're looking through the lens of hurt and through the lens of anger. And, and somehow we've got to be able to come up above that. But let me, let me acknowledge what some of you are already feeling, but you're too polite to say this. Um, I know it's very tricky when a white pastor tells a mixed congregation that we need to rise up above our offenses. Um, let me just acknowledge that for you, because some of you are like, I wasn't thinking that. I was totally thinking that. Um, <clears throat> I, I admit, I, what, what we've been through, what I've been through, it's different, okay? It probably doesn't even compare with what some, some of you have been through in this room. Um, I, I have two sons. I've never had to talk with them about how to interact with the police. I haven't. Let me just say that. I haven't. I don't know what some of you have gone through. Um, but I do know somebody who has, and his name is Jesus. And Jesus was stabbed in the back by one of his closest friends, was abandoned by the rest of them, and was stripped naked and hung nude on a cross while he is being mocked by his enemies. I think Jesus can associate with being offended. But somehow, Jesus was able to come up above that, to not sink down in that and live in that place, but to actually rise above the offenses that came against him. And, and, and let, let me say it like this. Um, every single one of us will get offended but Christians have lost the right to stay offended. Jesus says offenses will come, all right? We're all gonna get offended. Somebody's gonna do us wrong, either actual or perceived. I know sometimes we're like, oh, I can't believe that. And that, there was no ill intent on the other side. It's, sometimes it's in our filter, but I'm telling you, offenses are gonna come. We're gonna get offended, but as Christians, we cannot stay offended. And we cannot demand that of the world, but God does demand that of his people because we have the capacity to actually rise up above offense because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives on the inside of us. We have the capacity to rise up above the offenses in our life. It's just not gonna be easy. So we're gonna get offended. We just can't stay offended um, um, because, and here's the deal, offense is so dangerous. I want us to walk this through. I want us to walk this idea through. Jesus, um, in Matthew 24, he speaks briefly about what's going to happen at the end times, but I believe this is so relevant to us today. Matthew 24, 10. Um, here's what I would call kind of like the, the, the process of offense or the life cycle of offense. It says, notice these four things I have underlined. Many will be offended. Then they will betray one another and then they will hate one another, and then many false prophets will arise and deceive many. Um, let's go to that, that first slide, okay? I wanna, let me just kind of walk through this and see if, see if you've ever found yourself in this. Um, many will be offended. That, that word offense, okay, in the Greek is the word scandalon. You can't just say that like, 
like Mufasa, <laughs> like Scandalon. <laughs> like, that's, that's a good word, Scandalon. That's where we get the word scandal from. That's where we get scandalous from, Scandalon. Many will be offended. Uh, the word Scandalon, what it actually is, it's the, um, the bait on a trap. Imagine just like a bear trap, an animal trap, and it's the bait that's right there where you're like, oh, that looks pretty good, right? Now imagine, many will be offended, scandal on. Has this ever happened to you before? Somebody does something, and you're like, yeah, that's right, they did do me wrong. And you're like, why can't I get away from this? Why am I sitting in my bed thinking about this? Why am I pressing replay on what they did to me? Why am I still upset with these people? Because the jaws of Scandalon have grabbed you and there's a chain and you can't get away from the trap. That's what offense is, the Scandalon. Many will be Scandaloned. Then what that's gonna do, if you stay Scandaloned, you will betray one another. Betray uh, means I no longer have your back. I'm not gonna defend you any longer. In other words, you did me wrong. Whatever happens to you is fine. And so I might even do it myself to you, right? And so that's what happens when you stay in offense. And if you stay in that place of not having each other's backs long enough, you'll eventually hate one another. Hate means there's no longer grace for this relationship. I'm done with you. I'm done with you, right? Because that's where offense will take you. You stay in scandal long, you get betrayed, you start hating each other. And then ultimately what that does, listen, it opens you up to the voice of false prophets. I've seen this in church time and time and time again. Somebody got offended at the pastor. Somebody got offended at a leader. Uh, they start backbiting a little bit. They end up, I don't even want anything to do with you. Now you look at them a year later, they're not even in church. They're not serving God because their ears got opened up to a false prophet. But what happened was the scandal on had their teeth in them. This happens in marriages, right? In our relationship in a marriage. That, that you get offended at each other, you never reconcile, and it just keeps going, keeps going, keeps going to the point where the voices come in and now your ears are actually open to hear these voices saying, you don't need them. You should divorce them. You could do better on your own. That you, you need to upgrade to a new model. This is what happens in a relationship with, with each other, right? With, with different skin colors and cultures. This is how the false prophets is the only way that somebody could possibly believe that one skin color is better than the other. How foolish is that? Come on. This, the false, voice of a false prophet is the only way that something like black Hebrew Israelites exist. Some of you are like, what is that? It's basically the... These dudes who are like hyper aggressive. Don't even try and debate one of these guys. Um, it's, it's the voice of deception is what it is. And it's these guys who believe that black Africans are actually the lost tribe of Israel. And they're the only ones that God loves. And that sounds just as stupid as white nationalists who say that white skin is better than brown skin. Right? But that's only possible through the voice of a false prophet. And the only way that your ears are open to the voice of deception is because you're offended. And you know what else is the voice of a false prophet sometimes? The news. The news. Now listen, I'm not doing like hashtag fake news. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> this is my story, okay? This is where I'm saying maybe some of you are offended and you wouldn't call it offense, but you're actually offended. Um, I, I, I grew up in the 80s. I was a kid in the 80s. Thank God, turning 39 on Thursday. Clinging to 30s for dear life, Jesus. Um, I grew up uh, as a kid in the 80s. And um, what, a very God-loving family. My dad was a pastor. I mean, our family loved people. And I remember this, what would happen. And, and I shared experience with some of, of, others of us in the room. We'd, we'd eat dinner together every night. We'd finish dinner. And then I would be playing while my parents were watching the news. Give me grace when I say these things. My parents would be watching the news. I'm four years old. I'm five years old, whatever. And they're just watching the news, right? And what do I hear? What do I see out of the corner of my eyes on the news? Black people stealing, killing, robbing, getting arrested for drugs. Every single night. Every single night. Every four years old, five years old, six years old, seven year old, eight years old. I see it every night. Every picture I see of a black person is a criminal. And you can say, well, they were just reporting. I found out the news is very selective sometimes in what they report. <laughs> there was never a white criminal, <laughs> ever? <laughs> like, ever? <laughs> they were all black? Like, really? 
Because there's a narrative out there in the world. And there's a spirit of offense. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this is not a battle against flesh and blood. There is flesh and blood involved, but this is spiritually motivated. What I'm telling you is, I was a five-year-old who I would have never said this. I, I, wouldn't, I don't even know if I would have thought this because I didn't know anything else. I was a five-year-old who, who thought that black people were lazy, violent, and should be avoided. But I didn't even know one. I had never even met a black person. But I had this like, Great Wall of China prejudice, like, oh, against, against somebody who just looked like that. And I never even met one. Never even met somebody who didn't look like me. And I'd grow up from there, right? You know, I, I had one black friend in high school because there were three black people in my high school. <laughs> I just lived in the area. There weren't many black people in the mountains of North Carolina. Uh, not, not too friendly up there. And, and then I went to UGA and... Um, thousands of black people didn't have one relationship with a black person while I was there. And it wasn't until I came to victory when I actually sat down with somebody who was black and I was like, wait a second. You're not what the news said you were. This is 1999, by the way. It's not like last week. Like, <laughs> so we're like I'm not sure if you should be the pastor of this church. I remember sitting down across the table being like, whoa, we are way more alike than I thought that we were. We may have different backgrounds and different experiences, but I'm sitting, like, we, we both love God. Like, we both have pretty much the same goals in life. Like, we both love the same things. Like, and I, I went back, and I just started thinking about it. I was like, listen, guys, there are so many false prophets in this world who are telling this narrative. Let, in fact, let me say this. Let me say this. Um, let, let me help it to make sense for some of you in the room who may be not white, but let me speak directly to you if you're white. There, there's a voice of fall, false prophecy in, in, in this country, specifically in this country, okay? And what it is, it's a voice of division. I'm here today to tell you, as a white friend to you who are white, black people are not criminals, and Latino people are not here for your jobs. Yeah. <laughs> They're not. They're not, but that's the narrative because I'm telling you, as long as that message keeps going out and you hear black people, I mean, black people are this and criminals and shouldn't trust them. Latino people are getting our jobs and you're like, that's right. I should hate all those people. We should never do anything with them. We should just stay in our own little camps and go to church in our own little groups, right? I'm just telling you guys, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. And we belong to a different truth, we belong to a different family, and we have a different father. And I'm here today to tell you, please hear me when I say this, if you're black, I love you. I love you. If you're Latino, I love you. If you're Asian, I love you. If you're white, sometimes I get so frustrated with, with us, but I love you too. And I think that's the calling, man. That's the calling, that there has to be something inside us that says maybe what I'm believing about people is not true, and I need to rise above these offenses. I believe that prejudice and offense are like best friends. And that's why I say some of us would say I'm not offended, but what happened is the, the trap of prejudice is all over your heart. And so you want nothing to do with other people. There's already bars up over your heart before you even meet them. You can see them from a distance. No, I wouldn't like that person. What? And I'm just telling you, I, I, I don't know, I, I wasn't raised in the other side, but I do know people who are black, who their parents are black, and said, you can never trust a white person. Grandparents who said, who grew up in the civil rights said, hey, you, white people will never help you out for nothing. You got to do it for yourself. And you didn't trust your prejudice against white people before you even knew one. What I'm saying is we got to come up higher. We got to come up higher than this. Here's what Jesus says about Satan. This is so good. John 8, 44. Jesus says, Satan, he has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he lies, it is consistent with his character. He, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus says that Satan is the father of lies. He also calls them the accuser of the brethren. All right, this is what happens in marriage. 
You'll get accused. Oh, what are they doing? They're probably doing that. Man, that's the enemy trying to come in and implode your marriage. All right, it, you know, pitch you against one another. He is the accuser of the brethren. He is the father of lies. That's what Jesus says about Satan. What does he say about the Holy Spirit? John 14, 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. Satan is the father of lies. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And, and let me tell you, this is 12.30 this morning. I was out in the parking lot. Here, it's just what I do. Sorry, thank you for not calling the police on me. I'm walking around in the dead of night in the middle of the parking lot. And I was praying over today. And I said, God, over every single life, over every single heart, over every single mind that comes in, I pray that the spirit of truth would destroy the father of lies in our midst. And that every lie that we've believed, every prejudice that we bought into, let the spirit of truth come in and just burn it all away and make us one. One. Make us one people. That has to, we got to rise up above it. And, and, and let, let, me, let me say this. I, I, I used to say this. I used to, and I'm going to stop saying this. I used to say this a lot that I don't get offended very easily. Um, I'm going to say this and we'll move on and close. Um, I used to say I don't get offended very easily. If you know me, I'm a, I'm a pretty laid back personality. I, it takes a lot to ruffle my feathers. Um, but I, I sat down with a pastor friend of mine who was a counselor just a few weeks ago. And I said that. I said, hey, man, you know, you know, I, I just don't get offended very easily. And he said, hey, can I challenge that for a second? I said, sure. You know, he knows me really well. And he said, yeah, I think you're lying to yourself. I was like, well, then, <laughs> well, <laughs> tell me what you really think. And he said, no, I think when you say I don't get offended very easily, I think you're trying to convince yourself of that. I think you want that to be true, but I think what you're really doing is denying the emotions that are there. You're trying to pretend like you're not hurt, but you're actually hurt. And I was like, oh, you're right. Because like, like really, like really, like I, I don't want to be offended easily. I don't because I see Jesus. I want to be like that. Like I, I see Jesus forgiving the people who are murdering him. And I'm like, I, I, I give me two scoops of that. Like I want to be able to do that, right? But, but I, I was like, you're right. And, and I, think, I think the message is this, is that Jesus is saying the way to rise above offense is not to say that you're not offended. The way to rise above offense is to go to God and say, God, I'm deeply offended. I'm like deeply offended and to start to pour it out. Like when they did that, it made me feel this way. Like actually verbalize that, like out of your mouth. When she said that, here's how it made me feel. It made me feel like I wasn't important. It made me feel like they think that they were better than me. It made this, it made me feel like I wasn't loved. Like that's the Psalms, right? You ever read the Psalms? The Psalms are like a hundred plus chapters of David complaining. Like God's big enough to hear your complaints, all right? And I'm telling you, when you go to God and you say, God, that, I'm, I'm, I'm a little upset. <laughs> like what they did, what they said, what she did, whatever spouse, other race, whatever that is. Like God, help me, help me. I don't know how to fix this, but Jesus does. Jesus is the answer. The gospel is the answer on the inside of here. And so, God, I'm praying that as I confess this, as I say, God, this really hurts, God, that you would come in and you would start to heal me from the inside out so that I would actually be able to walk in love and rise above the offenses that come my way. Because offenses will come, but we have to learn how to walk above them. All right, and here's the last thing. Here's the last thing. Walking in the higher way of love. I must live in a perpetual state of forgiveness. I have to live in a perpetual state of forgiveness. Um, here's what I mean. We live in a world, I've never seen it like this before. It's not like I've been alive forever, but I've, I've never seen the world so ready to be offended. Everybody is just waiting to be offended. Like they're waiting for you to do something so they can jump all over you. Like social media is the worst about this. Like I'm just ready to be done, right? Like you post one thing that has a little hint or could be misconstrued, boom, like you're destroyed. Everybody's looking for reasons to be offended. And I'm starting to ask myself, like what would happen if we actually did it different? Instead of walking around looking to be offended, what if we actually walked around looking to forgive? What if we walked around actually rising up higher than the offenses that are coming our way, having a different perspective on it? Because here's the deal. The world can't forgive, not the way we do. They don't have the love that we have. And so the world's in it, but we can come above it. 
And here, here's what I found out. This totally changes your perspective, your, your position in life, because I've seen so many people who are just victims, man. Not meaning a victim of life, but they walk around with a victim mentality. And so they hear a racial thing. They're like, whoa, whoa, mm, mm, mm. They're like, whoa, like, because I'm a victim, right? Because I receive it all. No, listen, you get to decide what comes in here. You, nobody can make you be offended. I'm the doorkeeper of my heart, right? People can say stuff, but whether or not it gets in is my decision, all right? And so I can either live as a victim waiting to be offended, or I can live as a victor walking around offering forgiveness to the world. Man, that's different. One is being, being subject to the world. The other one is being more than a conqueror and walking around victorious, walking in victory. That's why we named the church Victory, so we can actually live in victory in life, man. Paul says this, uh, Acts 24, 16, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense towards God and men. And I think what's gonna have to happen, we just gotta start seeing people differently. We, we have to start seeing people instead of through the lens of what they've done to us, I need to see people through the lens of what Jesus did for them. Because that changes. When I start seeing people the way that Jesus sees people through the lens of the cross, through the, through the filter of the blood of Jesus, it changes my interactions. Instead of just looking to be angry, it, listen, instead of being angry at the world for acting like the world, right? You ever found somebody who wasn't a Christian who acted like they weren't a Christian and then you got upset with them for acting like they weren't a Christian? How dare you act like you're not a Christian? I'm not a Christian. Well, still. People who aren't born again do unborn again things. Instead, instead of walking around machine gunning everybody with offense, man, what would happen if I actually just saw them like, man, hurting people hurt people? What if I actually engaged them with love instead of shooting them back with all the ways that they're wrong? I was in a meeting uh, about 18 months ago with a room full of pastors. <laughs> and um, there's about six of us. And um, a mixed, mixed group in there. And Reverend Raphael Warnock was in there. And Reverend Warnock is the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church downtown, Dr. King's church. Like, he is, Dr. Warnock is the pastor of historically the most famous black church in America. All right? And over here, there's one of my white pastor friends. Don't worry, he's not a pastor at Victory. And Dr. Warnock is sharing uh, his heart on unity, his heart on ra racial reconciliation. He finishes, <laughs> and then my nice, naive white friend, uh, who's a pastor, says, wow, Dr. Warnock, you are so articulate. Wow. <laughs> like the whole room are like, <laughs> like you don't do that. You can't say that. Like the meeting was going so good. Why did you go and ruin it? And you saw Dr. Warnock and he goes, <sighs> you saw he had, to, he had to take a second. Some of you are like, why, why is this such a big deal? Okay. Um, and he goes, he looks at him and he says, let me help you out. And he proceeds for about 10 minutes, no, to tell the most loving, kind, forgiveness-bathed, walking in the way of love explanation on why a white man should not say that a black man is articulate. Because what you're doing when you say that a black man is articulate, you're implying that black people are not articulate. And look, you found one who is. But he said it much kinder than I just did. And, I, I, and what, what happened was my white pastor friend was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I did not even know that that was a thing. And so if, he, if Reverend Warnock had come back, offense, offense, how dare you? then now unity would have turned into two. But instead he replied with forgiveness and now the white guy's actually better and now we're actually one people. I'm telling you, that's the power of forgiveness. Instead of telling people how wrong they're, how dare you, assuming the worst about people's motives, what if you just said, I'm just gonna assume you didn't know what you just did and I'm gonna love you through it. And I've seen people who are looking for reasons to be offended and I've seen people who are looking for reasons to forgive and I wanna be the second one. I wanna walk around looking to forgive people. And what we gotta do, we gotta take this whole thing and we gotta pray. I'm just telling you, this is the last thing and then we'll close. We gotta pray. Here's what I say, whenever I see people who are, who are long-term offended, wounded, bitter, um, judging, angry, I just know they don't pray about it. 
And I, I say that with kindness. I say that with humility. Like we, we talk about it. We, we post about it. We gossip about it. We replay about it, right? But we don't pray about it. And I'm just telling you, the first thing we have to do, we got to go to God and we got to say, God, examine my heart. And if I'm offended, the first thing I have to do is say, God, I'm sorry for actually receiving this offense inside my heart. Okay, forgive me for being offended. And then I turn and say, God, I now forgive them for what they did, whether they meant to do it or didn't mean to do it. I forgive them and I bless them. I want God's best for them. I pray that you would reveal yourself to them, that you would increase them, that they would enter into a new, I mean, just bless them, bless them, bless them. And here's what I found out, that when you bless people who've offended you, it may not change them, but it does change you. It changes my heart because now my heart is actually open for reconciliation. There are no bars around my heart. There's no filter of woundedness and offense and anger. Man, I'm clean. I'm clean. It's just like Colossians 3 says, we read this a minute ago, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tenderhearted mercy, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you so you must forgive others. And above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Guys, let's rise above the offenses that come our way because they will come. Let's live a life of perpetual forgiveness. And by all means, let's learn to love the people even who hate us and bless those who persecute us and to clothe ourselves with love, with humility, so we could actually have harmony and oneness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. God, um, wow. Sometimes some of the stuff we have to talk about isn't the most fun things because it brings up pain. It brings up um, sin. I even think about my history and how I, how I used to view people. God, I, that's not fun to think back on, but... But God, I thank you that you're the one who brings things up, even the things that we see happening in our nation right now. God, I believe that you don't allow those things to be brought up just to cause pain. You allow things to be brought up to the surface so they can be healed and so they can be changed. And so God, even some of the emotions maybe that are in our hearts right now, maybe things that people have said to us or done to us or a spouse has done to us or another, another culture has done to us, God, that those memories are starting to come back right now. God, I thank you that you're not allowing those things to be brought up just to cause us pain. You're allowing them to be brought up so they can be healed. And so God, we invite the spirit of truth into the room right now. God, the spirit of truth that's bigger and better than any lies of the enemy. And God, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, spirit of truth, burn away the father of lies. Burn away our prejudice. Burn away our offense. God, burn away the division that's tried to creep in. Burn away, God, the, the false prophecy that we've listened to about other people groups. And God, may we believe the truth about one another, God truth, heaven truth. And may we see one another as you see us. God, I'm praying right now that by the power of Jesus Christ, that you would make us one. Oh God, make us one. May we clothe ourselves with love. Make us one. Make us one people so that this world would know that Jesus was sent from the Father. And, and I know this because I've experienced it in my own life that listen, this, this type of love that we're talking about today, it's only possible through Christ. Again, we can only love others because he loved us first. This is, this is not your love that you're giving to people. The best you can do is goodwill. You can't give love, not real love. And you can only forgive others as you've been forgiven. And here's some really good news. Even, even when you were far away from God, didn't want anything to do with him. He pursued you, he loved you, he died for you, he rose again for you, and he's here for you right now. And maybe just even over, over the last few minutes, you've just kind of felt that like a magnet, like, like God drawing, saying, hey, hey, I'm, I'm still here. Hey, I love you. Hey, you haven't done too much. I can forgive even that. If you want into this family today, it's only by faith in Jesus. 
All right, so maybe today, you're, maybe you're ready to say yes to Jesus. And it, here's what it is. It's a faith confession saying, yes, I, I'm, I believe in Christ. And it's also accompanied with this life statement that says, I'm going to repent. And repent is a, is a really big Bible word, which basically means I'm going to stop going the way I'm going. And I'm going to do a 180, turn around and start going God's way. And so if you say, hey, today, I want to make that statement, then I'm going to invite you to pray with me. And, and family of God in this room, we're going to pray this together. Let's say this. Say, Jesus Thank you for loving me even when I didn't love you. Thank you for dying for me even when I hated you. And right now, I receive your life, your forgiveness, your purity. God, right now, I turn from my way. I repent. I lay down my prejudice, my offenses any racist tendencies, any heart of division, and I give you all the lies I believed, and I turn to you to go your way, the path of life for the rest of my life. Jesus Christ, you are my King and you are my Savior. Father, right now, we thank you for hearts that are born again. We thank you, God, for transforming us from the inside out. God, I thank you that even right now that the spirit of truth is transforming us and making us new people. God, I pray over us that as we leave here today, God, that we would believe your truth more than any lies of the world. God, we're about to go back out into a place that's full of pro false prophets and lies and about people groups, about each other. God, I just pray that we would believe you over any of that. And God, that you would knit us together as one people in love so that the kingdom would come and your will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.